Hello everyone, welcome back. I am Dr. Alexandra Mayer. In today's video, we are diving into one of the more popular topics on my channel. We're diving back into testosterone. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about testosterone metabolites and maybe why testosterone could show up normal on labs, but you could still have symptoms of high testosterone. So before we dive into this, if you like the videos that we're putting out, please go ahead and like the video for us. Um, drop a comment below every single time you do that. It really helps us with the YouTube algorithm so that we can get this video out there to more women and just help more women like you. Um, so diving into this topic, we've talked a lot about testosterone in the past, right? We've talked about testosterone and then we've talked about sex hormone binding globulin. So we've talked about that ratio between testosterone and free testosterone and how some of your testosterone is bound up by sex hormone binding globulin, which plays a big role in symptoms. However, that's not the only part of the puzzle. And so today we're going to be diving down the next part of the puzzle, which is testosterone metabolites. Um, this particularly comes into play when we think about patients who have symptoms of high testosterone. So what does that look like? So symptoms of like acne, um, oily skin, hirsutism, so signs of like hair growth on the chin, um, lip, nipples, um, and then hair loss. And we do usually, so a lot of the research we're going to actually go, be going through today is kind of in the hair loss phase of things, but um, in general, this is something to consider if patients are having signs of high testosterone, especially if they're having signs of high testosterone, but they're not necessarily showing up on labs, right? So what's interesting, we've talked about polycystic ovary syndrome in the past, and with polycystic ovary syndrome, um, one of the criteria for polycystic ovary syndrome is high testosterone levels on labs or subjective. Well, what does that mean? Basically, it means that you can have signs of high testosterone, so a little bit of like hair growth on the lip, hair growth on the chin, um, acne, right, things like that, and not necessarily have it show up on labs and we still count it. Well, how is that? The case, right? Like, how is that what's happening right now? Um, and it makes a lot of sense if you start to think about testosterone metabolites. That's what we're going to talk about next. So, with testosterone, um, you can take your testosterone down a few different pathways. One of the pathways that you can go down is a pathway called five alpha reductase. And people will naturally favor one, like favor the, favor the beta pathway or favor the alpha pathway, um, depending on kind of your genetics, lifestyle, and some other factors. Um, when we favor 5-alpha reductase, what that means is that we take our testosterone down the 5-alpha reductase pathway and we turn it into metabolites, including DHT. Um, DHT is dihydrotestosterone. We think about dihydrotestosterone, um, we think about hair loss, right? Because that's what has been shown to be high in androgenic alopecia at the level of the hair follicle. And it's what medications like finasteride or propecia, same medication, um, block. They block 5-alpha reductase activity. So why would we want to block 5-alpha reductase? Well, the reason why is because when we go down the 5-alpha reductase pathway, testosterone becomes four times stronger. So what that means is that these metabolites could be a major contributor to symptoms in patients without testosterone actually being high. Um, and we're going to talk about some contributing factors and then maybe some things that have been shown to help with, five, with reducing 5-alpha reductase activity. So first of all, if we want to measure, can we measure 5-alpha reductase activity? Well, we could, right? So we could measure serum DHT in women, right? And see how that is. Um, and then we can also measure this on Dutch testing. So Dutch is dried urine hormone testing, and uh, it does measure our metabolites. So we talked about this a little bit with estrogen in the past, but it does also measure testosterone metabolites. So it will tell you if you favor 5-beta or 5-alpha reductase. Um, so one of the things that pushes us to go down 5-alpha reductase is insulin resistance. If you are having signs of high testosterone, um, and especially if your testosterone is pretty normal, right? Or if you know that your DHT is high, um, then insulin resistance is one of the number one reasons why we would favor a 5-alpha reductase pathway. We know that higher levels of insulin causes us to go down the 5-alpha reductase pathway more readily. So um, getting insulin tested is really important. Now, insulin is this like ridiculous range, right? So um, when you look at the range for fasting insulin, it's a really, really big range. And honestly, you want your fasting insulin to be in a much smaller level. So if you're running insulin, it should always be fasting. Um, and it should be about five to six in the morning um, fasting. So that really narrows down that range a lot. Outside of that, sometimes you can end up with a little bit of insulin resistance, right? Which is what we talk about when we have too high of insulin. Um, and that can definitely cause you to go into 
5-alpha-reductase activity and into DHT. So let's talk about ways to block 5-alpha-reductase activity or lower DHT. And the first way that we're going to talk about is medication. So medication is going to be Propecia or Finasteride, which are the same medication, or Avidart. Um, both of those block 5-alpha-reductase activity. They're very, very effective. Um, some patients do have side effects on these medications, but they are very, very effective. Next, we're going to go into kind of the next thing that we think about. The next thing we think about is an herb called sal palmetto. Um, sal palmetto is also a 5 alpha reductase blocker. Um, it is significantly less strong than Propecia or Finasteride. So patients sometimes maybe don't do as well on those medications, occasionally can, can still do well on sal palmetto. Um, we think about sal palmetto as being a prostate herb, right? But if you think about the medications that I just listed, Avidar actually is a prostate medication. So it makes sense. Um, they can be very helpful even in women, like salt palmetto can be very helpful in women who have that 5-alpha reductase activity being a little bit more favored um, and helping to lower our, our levels of DHT. The next thing we think about is um, pumpkin seed oil. Pumpkin seed oil has some interesting studies behind it. And again, it lowers DHT by decreasing 5-alpha reductase activity. So all of these things are working on the exact same enzyme. The next thing we want to think about would be coconut oil. So in a test tube study, so this does need more studies in, in humans, but in a test tube study, um, the lauric acid in coconut oil, which is the main uh, medium chain triglyceride in coconut oil, actually was shown to decrease DHT levels. So that could be an interesting kind of easy addition that people can add to their diet in terms of kind of helping to hopefully favor the beta pathway a little bit more. Now we're going into two things that in preclinical trials have been shown to lower DHT levels and that's quercetin and turmeric. Um, the nice thing about both of these is that they're, they're dietary additions, right? So quercetin is found in things like onions. It's really high in onions. It's high in asparagus. Um, it's high in apples. Um, and then obviously turmeric, right, is in a lot of spice mixtures and is something that a lot of people take as a supplement. Both of those in preclinical trials have been shown to lower levels of DHT, so can be helpful if we're experiencing those signs of high androgens. Um, the other thing that we do know is that with patients, especially polycystic ovary syndrome patients, right, um, you can have higher levels of DHT and higher levels of those androgenic symptoms um, and have higher levels of inflammation. So what we find is when we get, when we promote those anti-inflammatory um, agents, patients tend to have an improvement in symptoms. And so turmeric has been shown in preclinical trials to help with DHT, but might also have that um, anti-inflammatory component that we think of with turmeric as being helpful in, in those symptom management as well. And the last thing would be soy isoflavones. So I talked about soy isoflavones in a lot of different videos. Um, with soy, it is really important to always get organic and non-GMO, um, but soy isoflavones have also had some interesting preclinical trials on lowering DHT levels. And we know that soy isoflavones can also help with PMS, we talked about this in the PMS video, um, and can help with um, estrogen even. So there's a lot of different hormonal components, hormonal pathways that soy isoflavones can help with. Um, what's important to think about with this is that a lot of the time when we're thinking about those high androgenic symptoms, right, without necessarily having high testosterone, so in polycystic ovary syndrome patients, a lot of the time um, patients will kind of be misjudged or mislabeled based on weight. So what we know is that we talked about insulin resistance being a main contributor in going down the 5 alpha reductase pathway. You can have insulin resistance really at any weight. And I think that's really important to know because um, sometimes patients will go to doctors and they will have signs of polycystic ovary syndrome, but doctors will say, well, no, you're normal weight, so you don't really like fit the criteria for that, right? Um, that is not necessarily the case because we do know that insulin resistance can raise in really any population. Um, the other thing to think about is that with insulin resistance, you don't necessarily have to have blood sugar dysregulation, right? So you could be taking fasting blood sugars and they could be ideal. You could have a hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of blood sugar over three months. That's completely ideal, um, but still have a high levels of insulin. So if you are experiencing symptoms of high testosterone, things to consider would be definitely running a sex hormone binding globulin, which we've talked about in the past, and then maybe running some of these metabolites. So if we're gonna run the metabolites serum, right, the only way to run them serum would be maybe to run DHT serum DHT and see how high it is, um, or to run a dried urine test, because then you can actually check and see if you're favoring that 5-alpha reductase pathway. Um, and then definitely running a fasting insulin, because we know that's one of the things lifestyle-wise that we can 
play a huge role in and um, can make our symptoms way better. So tell me, have you guys ever looked at this? Have you ever looked at serum DHT, especially if you're a polycystic ovary syndrome patient with kind of signs of high androgen?